The Spartans, tough, terrifying, and fearless. These guys are not to be messed with because they always mean business when they're marching down the battlefield. So far, the only thing most of us know about them is what we've seen in the movies. They're face off with the Persian Empire and the 300 soldiers that sacrificed their lives to protect their freedom. But I really don't think the movies give us a full look on how life really was like for any Spartan man or woman. So in this video, we're gonna talk about why it was really, really tough being a Spartan. Number 10, tough love. Infanticide is not uncommon in the ancient world. The Greeks and Romans have had their share in committing this deplorable act for various reasons. However, when it came to the Spartans, the introduction of the individual into their society starts the moment he or she comes out of the womb. Organized and managed by the state itself, all Spartan infants were brought to a council of inspectors who will examine the child for any sign of physical defects. And should an infant possess as any sort of malformation or physical disability, they were left to die. Plutarch, an ancient historian, claims that the ill-born infants were tossed from the height of Mount Tagadis where they would plummet to their deaths. Modern historians, however, have dismissed this claim as pure myth. What was likely was that these infants were left out in the wild to die from exposure due to the elements, or if they are lucky, to be rescued by strangers and adopted into their family. Those who do pass the initial examination of the council aren't out of the woods just yet. In order to find out if they are healthy and to test their constitutions, these infants are bathed in wine instead of water. Also in this society, a crying infant was frequently ignored and little children are commanded not to fear the darkness or solitude. This may be completely unacceptable in modern society, but in the days of the Spartan, foreigners and invaders sought and strongly preferred Spartan women because of their skills as nurses and sitters, as well as their brand of disciplining a child through tough love. Number 9. In the Army Now in it never gets easy or better for a Spartan child as he grows up. Spartan boys in particular are taken away from their parents at the age of seven and placed in a strict military style education program called the Agoch, living in communal barracks. This system was designed to mold them into soldiers, skilled warriors, and upstanding citizens of the state. Aside from book learning, these boys were educated in athletics, hunting, and warfare. By the time they reached the age of 12, these soldiers to be moved to the next step of their education as they are deprived of all clothing except for a red cloak. They were then forced to sleep outside and expected to make their own beds from whatever they may find in the wild. To also ready them for the life in the battlefield, they were encouraged to hunt, scavenge, and even steal their food. However, if they were caught, the reprimand came in the form of floggings. Spartan girls endured an almost similar kind of education. While the boys are groomed into loyal and fearsome soldiers of the state, Spartan girls are expected to grow up into strong women who can bear children for their state. They were allowed to to remain with their families, but they are subjected to rigorous and equally strict programs. They are taught how to read and write as well as practice dance, gymnastics, the javelin, discus throwing, and many other arduous physical activities to make them physically strong for the role of motherhood. Number 8. Just like regular school, but worse. Spartans are some of the most literate and intelligent races in the ancient world. Children are schooled on reading, writing, poetry, and rhetoric. However, this was just one part of the strict education regimen Spartan children endured every single day. The Agoge was also a place where Spartan boys were subject to hazing from their peers and elders. The reason behind it was to toughen them and groom them into soldiers. It was a necessary form of yeah, encouragement to benefit their development as warriors and upstanding citizens. On normal days, fights and arguments would be instigated by instructors themselves as part of their curriculum. Basically, bullying was encouraged. The system of the Agoge was designed to train these youth into enduring hardships and be resilient to almost any kind of abuse hurled their way. Any sign of cowardice or timidity is met with teasing and most of the time physical violence from their peers and even superiors. Spartan girls were also encouraged to participate in this ritualized hazing. One example comes in the form of public humiliation. On special occasions like religious or state ceremonies, Spartan girls will get together and sing songs in front of Spartan dignitaries about the boys in the agoge. If a boy was performing badly in school, he was either singled out or seriously ridiculed in the song in order to shame him into stepping up his performance. Talking about throwing some serious shade. Number 7. A Pledge of Allegiance From their birth to their very last breath, Spartan men were expected to be lifelong soldiers and fiercely loyal to their states because, as terribly grueling the Spartan educational system was, the only option for your Spartan men was to become a soldier if he wished to become an equal among other citizens of Sparta. This was an edict from a Spartan lawmaker called Lycurgus who prevented Spartan men from legally choosing 
any occupation other than serving in the military. A commitment that would last for decades until they were allowed to retire at the age of 60. But even so, their retirement places them on reserve duty and can be called on any time by the state. Any other occupations such as farming, food production, and trade were left entirely to the class of free non-citizens as well as a class called helots enslaved by the Spartan state. Ironically, the helots made up the majority of the Spartan population and were known to revolt from time to time. A reason why Spartans devoted themselves almost religiously to building a strong military. Number six, the Spartan diet. If you think your trainer is giving you a hard time about what you should be eating, check out what the Spartans eat. It is no secret that Spartans are among the most fit races to have ever walked this earth. I mean, come on, you can see this guy's abs through a trench coat. This is due to the fact that they take physical fitness rather seriously and have an almost religious devotion to proper diet. Citizens who are overweight are publicly ridiculed and shamed, in extreme cases banished from the state just for their physical appearance. This extreme discipline on fitness and diet starts when a Spartan man enters the Sisitia, a military-style mess and commune for citizens who have completed the main phase of the Agolge at the age of 21. The Sisitia is a Spartan's replacement for a nuclear family of 15 citizens each, in which they would spend a number of years together until the age of 30. Wine was a staple in the Spartan diet, but they are strict about having a little too much to drink, believing that drunkenness is a shameful state for a Spartan to be in. And in order to steer Spartan youth away from being drunk, their elders would force slaves to get wasted to show the negative effects of alcohol. Number five, hunter's instincts. From the age of 18, a Spartan man is considered a true soldier and was called an iron war adult citizen. However, like any kind of military organization, the Spartan army has a separate branch reserved only for those who have performed exceptional. This arm is called the Kryptia or the Spartan Secret Service. And this group only accepts exceptional individuals into their fold and also only accepts Spartan men who are not above the age of 30. This special branch of the military is particularly cruel when it comes to training its soldiers as it requires their initiates to kill before they are let in. This bloody process was oftentimes started by an elected Spartan leader. Upon entering into office, he would declare war on the Helots and provoke them into revolts. This declaration would then make the killing of them perfectly legal from the perspective of the state's judiciary. Once an order was passed, these initiates will be sent out into Helot camps armed only with daggers and ambush them in the dark. Number four, Spartan bromance. A Spartan soldier's life was with his other soldiers. It comes as no surprise that given the strict education and training they had at an early age, Spartans are conditioned to treat his brothers in arms as his nuclear family. They are, however, allowed to marry, and many do so when they are living communally at the Sasitia because it is a requirement that Spartans should sire children. Though they may be married, soldiers are not allowed to live with their spouses. Equals, where soldiers who are at the age of 30 or above are allowed to be with their wives, but being an equal was not easily granted. While a soldier may be considered one once he reaches the appropriate age, he may lose it any time if he does something that disgraced himself or the state. Number three, king and country. Like any ancient civilization, the Spartans were ruled by a monarch. What sets the Spartans apart from other monarchies, however, is that they have two kings who share the throne. A diarchy is not entirely uncommon in ancient civilizations, but it can be rare. In the case of Sparta, the two kings were descended from the royal families of the Aegeus and the Europontes. By sometime around the 6th century BC, an arrangement was made in order to allow a diarchy to exist that allowed one king to remain in the city to rule and the other to lead military campaigns away from the state. For example, Leonidas was from the Agate family and he marched and commanded an army on his campaign to Thermopylae, while Lycotigetes from the Europonte family concerned himself with the internal matters of the state, despite being an accomplished and respected general himself. Another unique Spartan quality to their monarchy was that their kings are not immune from common civilian laws in the social conventions of the state in spite of their royal lineage. They are also known to exercise a form of democracy where representatives were placed in political positions and a legislature as well as a fully functioning judiciary system. Any infraction from Spartan law or custom by the king is prosecutable by the state's law. In one example, King Archidemus who committed the crime of marrying a thin petite woman that lawmakers deemed inappropriate because their union could only produce kinglets and not real kings, he was then 
been heavily fined by the state. Number two, love in the age of Sparta. Back in the day, marriages were political arrangements between states and countries in order to preserve their alliances or to forge new ones. It was the safest and surest way to also secure new territory and expand an army. Spartans, however, had a different view of marriage. For one, there seems to be no clear record of Spartans marrying outside of their race. It was known that they have a distaste of the Greeks and the Athenians and are extremely suspicious of foreigners and their motives. And Spartan marriages serve a more utilitarian function in their entire society in order to create offsprings. Love and true affection are looked down upon and are seen as signs of weakness that can put an individual to shame. Each Spartan is expected to marry an individual of great physical condition with the belief that perfection will spawn perfection, although such is not always the case. Number one, the greatest sin. Spartan soldiers are expected to fearlessly fight to the very last man and to his very last breath. With a well-trained and highly skilled military, the Spartans have made a name for themselves in history as one of the most ferocious armies in the world. Surrender was never an option to any Spartan soldier and any sign of it from a soldier is severely shamed by the military in the state. To live and die for Sparta is the Spartan soldier's mantra and laying down arms to an enemy was viewed as the epitome of cowardice. In an account by Herodotus, there were two soldiers who missed out on the famous battle of Thermopylae. When they returned home, they were disgraced and shamed. Later on, one of the soldiers hanged himself and the other one only redeemed himself after he died fighting in a later battle. Spartan women, especially mothers, also shared this responsibility to uphold the values of their state. Mothers have been known to tell their own children to return home with their shield or on it. Only when a soldier died in battle can he be considered as having completed his duty as a citizen. And by Spartan law, only two classes of people were allowed to have their names inscribed upon a tombstone. Women who died in childbirth or men who fell in battle. I guess if you were born into this society, this all really sounds uh, normal to you. So us looking at it now, we were like, okay, this is this is impossible. We, we can't possibly, I mean, I barely go to the gym. How can I be expected to, you know, live in the wilderness with a red cape? But that's why these were some of the most ferocious warriors in history. You know, I bet you it wouldn't be long until somebody actually invents the Spartan workout, which is basically, yeah, in the winter, you're just gonna go into the woods and, and survive for a month. All right, guys, thank you all so much for watching this video. I'll see you later.